I'm an inventor. Numbers. They can have meanings. 13 is unlucky. 666 for the mark of the beast. 7 is a holy number. And in the world of media, be it video games or movies, there is a number that symbolizes nothing but chaos and death. I'm talking, of course, about the dreaded number of 4. Halo 4, Spyro 4, Indiana Jones 4, Toy Story 4, Matrix 4, Sonic 4, Phantom Menace, Episode 1, <laughs> Star Wars 4. There's also a bunch of really good 4th entries. Kind of muddles my point. But, you know, there's still a connection here. I've connected the dots. The trilogy is just a perfect system. Beginning, middle, and end. There's nothing better than a trilogy wrapping everything up with that final movie. That final scene is that last note in a musical piece. Everything has built up to that conclusive, beautiful chord to leave a feeling of finality. <sighs> I gotta tell you, it was perfect. Everything, down to the last minute details. And then one of the fingers slip and hits an awkward minor key right after. That awkward minor key, that slip up, that's the fourth entry. Now, not all trilogies are perfect. In fact, a certain trilogy can be incredibly flawed, but still, that fourth entry can come around and fail so terribly that it makes the flawed trilogy look like it was crafted by the masters themselves. Hello? That... is Transformers 4. You defend my family. Or die. When the Michael Bay movies were coming out, they were despised, seen as the worst part of cinema. But now, today, they're kind of looked back on fondly, you know, at least by a certain demographic on a certain YouTube channel. Part of this is because of nostalgia, sure. Part of it because modern movies have really not improved, like, let's be honest here. And in terms of the Transformers franchise itself, this trilogy is remembered better because what came after was such an abomination. On this planet we have a saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I also have a saying, I don't care. You're a Paramount or Hasbro executive, and you like money. Transformers made a lot of money, more money than you've ever seen, and you don't want to stop this oil well from gushing. Only one problem, Michael Bay was not returning. Bay was pretty much done after Dark of the Moon, so Paramount and Hasbro now had to find a new director. There were rumored replacements for who they wanted to come in, one of which was Roland Emmerich. Could you have imagined, though, if Emmerich directed a Transformers movie? The acting could have been even worse. We could have had more CGI. We really missed out. But why did Bay come back? I thought he was done with the series. Did he lie to me? Did he lie to my fucking face? Well, two reasons. One, he wanted to control where the franchise would go after him. In interviews, he said it was like his baby, and it just felt wrong having another director come in. So, it was just one of those things. It's like, when you look what's going on in the film business with the franchise frenzy right now, why is Cameron doing two more Avatar movies? Why is Peter Jackson doing three more Hobbit movies that are in the same world as Lord of the Rings? When you have a franchise, it's very hard to give it up. I love that this article from 11 years ago shouted out the hit 2022 blockbuster Avatar 2 The Way of Water. Entire empires rose and fell before that thing came to theaters. When you're talking about doing another sequel after a successful trilogy, one thing you should probably avoid doing is mentioning Peter Jackson and The Hobbit. More of a tragic tale warning of uh, what to avoid, like the ring wraiths. So Bay had some ideas and a direction that he wanted the franchise to go in. And his plan was to plant these seeds, J.J. Abrams style, and then just fuck off. J.J. Abrams style. This was supposed to be his official last Transformers movie. The lesson here is sometimes it takes an absolute embarrassment to make somebody finally walk away. Good morning, guys. Two, pain and gain. Remember pain and gain? I'm hot! Yeah, Bay agreed to come back to do Transformers 4 if Paramount would fund that movie. You know, the movie he actually wanted to make. 
Mix both into a blender, and what do we get? An empty void. Of nothing. We all lose. Most people already consider the Bayformer movies a soulless, passionless string of action sequences. But upon this rewatch of the entire series, I have to say they really aren't that. At least Transformers 1 and 3. There is effort and an energy behind the camera that's put into making these movies. Even if they have flaws and fail, and they fail a lot, there is still something there. You notice that distinct Bay style, one that's often overwhelming and obnoxious, but it still makes these films stand out, for better or worse. Hey, Professor, I'd do anything for an A. That doesn't exist in Transformers 4. Everything now just feels so sterile and hollow. It's almost like a fanfiction continuation of a story, like Optimus and Bumblebee were put through a wormhole into some bizarro dimension, one where they entirely forget about Sam, or any humans they previously knew, and now just hang out with Marky Mark and his funky bunch. There's this anime based on Lilo and Stitch, and the whole premise of the show is that Lilo dumps Stitch because she grew up, so Stitch just spends the entire series hanging out with this entirely different Japanese girl. The entire show is a blight on humanity, and it never should have been made. That's Transformers Age of Extinction. Mark Wahlberg is this anime girl, Optimus Prime is Stitch. The movies nowadays, that's the trouble. Sequels and remakes, bunch of crap. Let me sum this up as quickly as I can. Whew. Here we go. 65 million years ago, aliens wiped out the dinosaurs by turning them into metal. They used this metal to make Transformers. Forget about the AllSpark, this new thing is the canon now. Remember Ratchet? Medical officer? Kind of a goofball? Wow, that was tingly! Yeah, he just gets gunned down. There's this gray badass guy who apparently isn't an Autobot or Decepticon. Ooh, spooky. We meet our main character, Cade Yeager. Going through scrap in a small Texas town. Can't you tell we're in Texas? I don't really know. And like any true Texan, Cade sounds like he just walked out of Fenway Park after slamming a few too many Sam Adams. Jerry, you bring his big ass up here, he's gonna be huffing and puffing before he can squeeze out of that car. You back out on my grass, you're gonna be in big trouble. Cade is broke, and he has a daughter and TJ Miller to take care of. So being responsible, he buys a broken down truck to scrap it for parts. Upon buying this truck, he realizes it's a transformer and says the funny line. I'm an inventor. This could be a game changer for me. If I can apply that technology to my inventions, we never have to worry about money again. I've heard that before. Wow, that is by far the worst shit I have ever seen. He hotwires Optimus back to life, and TJ Miller stupidly sells them all out to the feds. Because of this action, they're all almost killed by Black Ops agents before Optimus saves their asses. TJ Miller dies. Cade's daughter has a hot Irish boyfriend who's also a race car driver. <laughs> That's his only attribute. Other than the, uh... <laughs> Fraser's been selling the actual scrap metal of dead Autobots to Stanley Tucci. He was given a blank check to wipe out the remaining Decepticons, but then decided to just wipe out both sides anyway, because he hates them Xeno scum. Nobody ever catches on that he was doing this. It turns out that this modern company in 2014 has figured out what makes these alien robots tick. And not only that, they have replicated their very metal. They now know how to manipulate it like it was a shitty special effect. They've also been accidentally rebuilding Megatron. Algorithms! Math! Why can't we make what we want to make? the way we want to make it! The gang goes to Chicago to confront KSI, leading to the Autobots wrecking up the place, killing Oreobot in the process. While driving away, KSI sends out Megatron, now called Galvatron, who they have 100% control over. Whoopsie. In the chaos, Lockdown comes out of nowhere and kidnaps Prime like he was Princess Peach. He also takes the girl who couldn't figure out how car doors work. Get out of here! So Cade, Boyfriend, and Autobots have to now sneak onto the ship to save the girl. And also Optimus, I guess. Are you telling me that thing's gonna be 
This is gonna be flying out of here in 10 minutes? Uh, 10 minutes? KSI freaks out and moves to their Chinese location, just like Activision Blizzard. Everyone, except for Stanley Tucci, figures out what Megatron's real plan is, and it's to use the space MacGuffin that blew up the dinosaurs on the city of Hong Kong, harvesting all of the metal to make a Transformer army. Megatron then wakes up and hijacks all the other KSI bots to make a Transformer army. The last third of the movie is nothing but fighting over this MacGuffin until all the bad guys die. Oh my God. Also, there's Dinobots. I like the Dinobots. After realizing that Mark Wahlberg is a pretty neat guy, Optimus Prime fucking shoots off into outer space, like Poochie going back to his home planet. I have to go now. My planet needs me. He even dies returning there. Let's just dissect these plot points further, shall we? It's like a game of operation, but with even more screaming. The humans wipe out the Autobots. No! No! no. Ah! Yup. After everything, uh, the government just guns down the Autobots in the streets and sells their bodies for parts. Or so I thought for the last, like, decade, because I haven't rewatched this movie since 2014. Technically, the Autobots were not hunted by the U.S. government. They were hunted by a CIA black ops unit called Cemetery Wind, led by Sideshow Bob. The purpose of Cemetery Wind was to wipe out the remaining Decepticons. But that didn't happen. And, uh, they, they just kill everyone. I get that Beast from the X-Men is a CIA black ops agent, and he's a scary guy, and he has all these connections throughout the government. But when it's somebody in Washington start to wonder where the leader of those giant robot cars went, does anybody actually care? Because I haven't even talked about how common people hate Transformers now. There's these goofy posters, people are ingrained to report whenever they see a robot. You think maybe the government does support this because nobody trusts the Autobots anymore. But nope. The government has nothing to do with these posters at all. They're not the bad guys in this, they're wondering where Optimus went. Even though it's their own guy that did this, and used their own resources. Uh, over uh, to the White House, just a powwow where we get maybe some more specifics about how exactly you're hunting the enemy Decepticons. It's like the movie liked the idea that the Autobots are outlawed, but it also didn't want the US to be the 100% bad guy. The only conclusion you can take away from this is the United States wiped out the Autobots with their own resources by accident. <laughs> These alien defenders of humanity who survived the civil war on Cybertron, who lived for thousands of years, were just brought down by the U.S. deep state. Yeah, that sounds about right. Whether or not you think this is an interesting direction to take the series, it's not. The end result just leaves us with this bitter taste in our mouth. A result from all of this is Optimus Prime kinda just hates humans now. They slaughtered wretched! I'm gonna tear them apart! You humans, after all we have done, how many more of my kind must be sacrificed? to atone for your mistakes. The last three movies were him and the Autobots defending Earth against the Decepticons, trying to prove that humans were something worth saving. And then the people just gunned them all down, off-screen. Wonderful. They even say they're just leaving Earth after this battle. But then we're done defending the humans. Like, they're sick of humans, they're sick of our shit. What? Done? What do you mean you're done? Means finished. See ya. The only reason the Autobots are even here in the next movie is just to hang out with Mark Wahlberg. Don't eat cars. Turns out Cemetery Wind was being helped out by some neutral bounty hunter called Lockdown. He's above the whole Autobot Decepticon thing. The only people he works for are the creators. Here's another fun fact. So that whole lore of the AllSpark granting Transformers life or whatever, I, I guess that was a lie or something. It was the creators. Creators made them, not the cube. Because not only were they here before the moon landing, or here before the pyramids were built, they were here in the land before time. And the way they made the Transformers was by creating some special metal by detonating some floating bombs. So what the hell did the AllSpark do? Did that not make them? What did the creators actually, like, create? Did they make the Transformers in a factory? 
Or did they just harvest the material and then use the AllSpark to bring the robots to life? Did the creators always intend on the robots turning into cars? Do the creators have cars? These are questions that will never be answered, as just like the Endless in Halo Infinite, we'll never find out what the fuck they are. And I know some might be typing in the comments that Quintessa is a creator, but uh, no, nerds. Apparently she's not. She's like something else entirely, I guess. A space witch. They don't even stick with this plot point into the next movie. The only real effect the creators end up having on the entire plot is that they created something called the Seed, and Stanley Tucci runs around with it for the last third of the movie. Excuse me! Excuse me, ladies, excuse me! Oh my god! How do you say get the fuck out of the way in Chinese? Tucci's character did all of this to patent the metal that he now calls Transformium. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's what we're going with. Okay, James Cameron. There are some concepts here that could have worked. Like, think about this. After the events of Chicago, humanity has lost all faith in the Autobots. A task force was created to clean up the remaining Decepticons, but since it's made up of men who lost people in Chicago, they just have a vendetta against any Transformer. I lost a sister in Chicago. You get no sympathy for me. And while I still really hate this plot point, upon my last rewatch, you can't blame people for thinking this way. Like, Optimus is kind of to blame for what happened in Chicago. He awoke Sentinel Prime, the supposed real leader of the Autobots, told everyone to trust him, only for Sentinel to then not only betray everybody, but also almost end humanity in the process. Don't think of these as funny big robots from the 80s. Imagine if this was actually real. Even if you knew the full story, Optimus still looks like an idiot who got bamboozled and thousands died for it. Yeah, take a look, Optimus. This is all on you! Stopping Sentinel and saving Chicago, it's kind of just putting out the fire that they accidentally started. So the government backs away, and in the confusion, this vengeful Black Ops team with unlimited resources takes out the Autobots in a surprise ambush. Also, Dinobots somehow fit into this. <laughs> this could have been a darker follow-up to the third movie. Optimus could feel guilt over putting faith in Sentinel Prime for accidentally leading to the events in Chicago. He might see his own judgment as the thing that broke that trust, the thing that led to these events. But no, Sentinel is never brought up once, nor are Optimus's feelings on any of this. Well, except for being mad that humans killed his friends. Bringing in a bounty hunter who doesn't give a shit about the Decepticons or Autobots is a pretty cool concept. Like, he just sees them as kids in a sandpit fighting one another. It makes the universe feel bigger that there can be Transformers out there that are neutral. But instead, Lockdown is pretty much just a Repo Man trying to take Optimus Prime back to his creators. What Lockdown is doing is never really explored because we never find out what the creators actually are. Even the fact there are a new set of characters that aren't tied to Sam Witwicky. That could have worked tremendously well. A single father, who's an inventor, and by his actions ends up making his family fugitives from the law for helping Optimus Prime? That sounds interesting. That has potential. It's executed terribly. I'd like to be fresh when I'm making out with your daughter. What an absolute black hole of entertainment these three are. Ten minutes? Uh -huh. Ten minutes? Like, look. Shia LaBeouf and the gang weren't peak fiction or anything, but there was at least something going on there. Sam was a self-centered doofus who, when the time came, did the right thing. Michaela, despite the internet saying otherwise, actually had a character. Not only did she know cars, there was more than meets the eye. With you. Okay. Also, there was John Turturro. He was the best character. That means goodbye. Who do we have now? Mark Wahlberg as Cade Yeager. God, I'll never get over that name. Look, I got nothing against Mark Wahlberg. I'm not a Vietnamese man in the 1980s, or a group of black fourth graders. I liked him in Ted, and the other guys, but oof. <laughs> Is he miscast in this? Like, like, tremendously miscast. Nothing about Cade Yeager as a character works 
at all. I can believe that aliens wiped out the dinosaurs before I can ever believe that this man invents robots on his ranch in the middle of Texas. Sir, do you want to see the property? Sure. I'd be more than happy to give you a tour. I'll show you three other buyers I got buried up back then. I'll crack your head open like an egg. This could have been more believable if it was established that he was like a transplant to Texas. But no, uh, the movie never does that. You know, we got a rule about people messing with people from Texas. As funny as it is to make fun of Wahlberg, he's not even that bad. Like, he's still, he's still bad, but he's kind of enjoyable in how fucking weird his line delivery always is. What is it now? What are you talking about? I mean, I'm doing stuff out of my league here! I like how Kate is more of a fighter compared to Shia LaBeouf, even if it required him getting this special little gun that makes no sense for Transformers to have. It gives him more agency. Nobody would really want another Shia just going... Optimus! Cade isn't great, but he's a hell of a lot better than these melting pieces of cardboard. Tessa is Cade's daughter. She's played by Nicola Peltz. If she looks familiar, well, you might know her better as Katara in The Last Airbender. She's not a bad actress because she's in these terrible projects. She's just not good. The Avatar was the only person born amongst all the nations. Fire Lord's son. You took him from our village. Mm, good. Tessa is meant to be the emotional crutch of the entire movie. Half of Cade's entire personality is just talking about how much he loves his daughter. And then we see his daughter, and she's just... Try to cook without ketchup, or balance your checkbook. Who always has to be the grown-up around here? There is nothing there for us, the audience, to care about, other than any dad that has a teenage daughter of his own and thinks, yes, I too would not want my daughter executed by the deep state. I mean, what can we say about Tessa as a character? She likes to party. Almost time to get it done and get wasted. <laughs> she lies to your father about dating this guy. And this guy, ooh, the boyfriend, the rally car driver sponsored by Red Bull. He probably has as much charisma as one of those background nest guys in the previous movies. Imagine if they gave that guy an entire movie, but also made him kind of gross. Uh, let's talk about the big T-Rex in the room. This infamous scene that will forever be in Hollywood history. The Romeo and Juliet Law. Cade had his daughter when he was still in high school, and he doesn't want her to date until she graduates. In a stunning twist, she has a boyfriend, and he saves everyone at the last second using his cool Rocket League powers. It could have turned out to just be some kid from her high school, and Cade's like, ooh, and, and wags his finger, and then they move on. But the movie didn't do that. For some reason, in this movie that the writers had complete creative control over, they chose to make this guy 20 years old, and the girl's 17. We dated for a little while, I was a sophomore and he was a senior, it's fine. No, it's not fine. We've got a pre-existing juvenile foundation relationship. Statute 2705-3. What? Texas statute? So was he 18 and she was 15? What the fuck? Why not just have both of their ages be 18? Why have a scene explaining a real-life law about why this fictional relationship is technically not statutory rape? Millions went into this film, thousands worked on this project, and nobody thought it was a bad idea to have this guy pull a card out from his wallet with a full legal definition of why he can legally bang a minor. Sorry to disappoint you, Yugi! Huh? You triggered my trap card! If that doesn't sum Hollywood up, I don't know what will. Funny story, Amazon Prime will sometimes have trivia in the corner of the screen whenever you pause a movie. When pausing at this moment, Amazon Prime had this little tidbit to say about the Romeo and Juliet law. And you know, I thought it was just so perfect, I'm gonna just read it verbatim. <coughs> Shane says that the Romeo and Juliet law protecting his and Tessa's relationship states that they can be together as they were already together when Shane was a minor. This is only partially correct. Shane has a legitimate defense against sexual assault, as Tessa has consented and is over the age of 17. And when they were dating when he was 17 and she was 14, there is an age difference of less than three years, provided Tessa turns 15 before Shane turns 18. However, 
The issue of their age difference, consent, prior relationship, and Tessa being 17, only applies to the crime of sexual assault. Romeo and Juliet laws do not protect him from the crime of sexual performance by a child for engaging in sexual contact, actual or simulated sexual intercourse with Tessa. Here, the relevant age to engage in sexual conduct is 18, she is 17, and the difference in age must be less than two years. There's three for a legitimate defense against the crime. So, long story short, this is wrong. This is not what the Romeo and Juliet law is about at all. Within the legal definition the movie itself set up, Transformers 4 involves a relationship that is not only illegal, but also has a main protagonist who could be arrested and charged with a second degree felony and sentenced to 20 years in prison under Texas law. I like to be fresh when I'm making out with your daughter. And the best part of this little Amazon fun fact is that it was labeled under goofs. Yeah, it certainly is a goof. Haha, <laughs> oops. He's a sex offender. Speaking of sex offenders, TJ Miller's in this. I think she looks hot. What did you say? Like a hot teenager. Oh, it's the teenager thing that makes it better. Thank you. I didn't say it did He dies terribly. What? Which is odd because he's kind of the comedic relief or this movie's attempt at one, and then he's just glassed. Little bit of a tone issue, I would say. It'd be like if Pippin and Mary were just brutally tore apart in front of the Fellowship. And it's a little odd to have your comedic funny guy just brutally explode. Wow, Lockdown's so cool, he has a gun that comes out of his face. I saw a few people online say that Lockdown was a really cool character who just needed to be in a better movie. And to that I say, <laughs> sure buddy. I don't care. Conceptually, he could have really worked at being this larger than life threat that can just take Optimus down with a big iron on his face. But just like the movie as a whole, good ideas lead to bad execution, literally. Tell me where he's hiding. Never. <laughs> Never is here. I don't see where people think Lockdown is cool. I kind of see him as a dork. It's my fight! And you're all gonna die! He says one-liners like that one kid in school who thinks he's so badass, but nobody else does. You're all gonna die! His dynamic with Kelsey Grammer is kind of interesting, though. Like, they both despise each other's species, but are working together for a common goal. Two racists banding together for the sake of racism. Harold Adinger is probably the most interesting aspect of this movie to me. He hates Transformers, but he likes what they could provide for the United States. Their tech. His actual plan is just to make a giant mechanized army. Adinger was intentionally killing every Transformer so no alien would be in America's way when they inevitably, you know. It's a fascinating story element once you actually dissect it, but it's just so terribly executed you never think about it again. Just like Adinger at the end of the movie. And you chose them. Galvatron's here too, I guess. He's not my Galvatron. Megatron? Is that you? Here's a hint. <laughs> That's not Leonard Nimoy. Oh wait, we already had Leonard Nimoy. Okay, I take that back. Speaking of voice actors, Megatron's voice actor for the last three films, Hugo Weaving, is just done. He left. He's free. And to replace him, they brought in Frank Welker. That's the original Megatron. Suck this Earth planet dry! Climb. Climb. I have no fear. It's kind of beautiful. Galvatron is poorly used, he looks terrible, and is a bit of a goober, but you know, I don't even care. We got Gen 1 Megatron back. He's here to stay for, like, one more movie before this franchise crashes and dies. Galvatron was made by Stanley Tucci to be this Optimus Prime replacement. Algorithms! But they used Megatron's head to do it. Honestly, how did you bozos imagine this was gonna go? Megatron slash Galvatron bamboozled KSI into building his new army, and the last third of this movie is these robots just running amok trying to get the MacGuffin. Oh man, these new robots. 
they are the worst Transformers in the entire series. And can you guess why? It's because they don't even transform. Say what you will about the previous three movies, but at least there was a mechanical presence to all the robots involved. When they transformed, you could see where each part shifted into the next. But here, they just didn't even bother anymore. Why does Transformium exist? It's so all the robots can appear and disappear at whim. They just deconstruct themselves into computer polygons and show up somewhere else. It's just so lazy now. You can't possibly expect the audience to see this and imagine it's tangible and interacting with real objects in this world. It's like the Pixels movie. And even the concept of these bots. They're supposed to be based on the Autobots. You know, clones, but better. Exactly like Mewtwo's plan in Pokemon the first movie. KSI even emphasizes in promotional material how much better this Stinger robot is compared to the old model of Bumblebee. Really, this alien's design was decrepit and let's face it, antique. <laughs> This KSI woman doesn't even know the difference between an Autobot and a Decepticon. Reduced to melting evil old Decepticons down. No, oh, that's an Autobot there. So in this world, people don't know the difference between Autobots and Decepticons, but they also might hate the Autobots. But also, they know who Bumblebee is specifically, enough to insult him on a personal level. Old and ratty and you mean no. ugly. How is this supposed to work in-universe? other than just for this one joke. The final battle involves fighting off the same five or so models. Now it finally makes sense why the Decepticons were always gray and black. It was to hide the repetition. Did KSI design them to look like that? I mean, we know they created Oreobot, so it wouldn't be too out of the realm of possibility. Rest in peace, Oreobot. You were the best of all of us. I hate the Autobots in this movie. He's like a child. This child is about to kick your ass. Cut the crap before I drop a grenade down your throat. I've been waiting for them all to dispatch each other so I could take charge with no trouble at all. We have Drift. He's just Ken Watanabe bot. He stands around and does Ken Watanabe stuff. Crosshairs is an asshole who doesn't seem like he even wants to be there. No, we'll let Prime figure this one out. Just me reporting to me. And then there's Hound, John Goodman bot. That's a bad idea, but I'm all about bad ideas. He's the most interesting Autobot, but, you know, there's not much competition. He's the one with an actual personality. Granted, it's a personality that can get annoying after a while, but it's something. I like that he's this big, fat, grizzled vet who just likes killing things. Take that, bitch. Oh! He's a walking arsenal. Literally has guns just falling off him. He's a robot that is obese and has a beard and smokes a metal cigar. None of that makes any sense. But I also look at Hound like I would look at anything in 40k. Why do these giant mechs have churches on them? Why does an entire chapter just ride on motorcycles? Why does this alien robot look like a 45-year-old American Marine? Cause it looks cool. I'm like a fat ballerina! And then there's Optimus, this poor, poor broken man. Optimus has spent years of his life and sacrificed his planet to protect humanity. And then all of his friends just get killed by them. It's just sad, really. Anything that happened in the previous trilogy is now just sort of pointless. We know that everyone here is gonna get gunned down by the federal government eventually. Any speech Optimus has about protecting humanity just makes him look foolish because we know that he's going to get stabbed in the back. They're a primitive, violent race. <laughs> Were we so different? We can make you now. Don't you get it? We don't need you anymore. We're done defending the humans. Now Optimus is just bitter. He doesn't feel like Optimus at all. But when I find out who's behind this, he's going to die. Or die. I'll kill you! The Dinobots in this are just dinosaurs. What is there to really say here? It's a shame we never got Gen 1 Grimlock. In my opinion, he's one of the greatest characters in all of fiction. Grimlock saved universe! <laughs> 
One compliment I can give this movie, though, is it didn't screw up robot dinosaurs. It gave them very little screen time, but it didn't screw them up. In the Bayverse, the Dinobots are apparently ancient knights who were imprisoned by lockdown. Despite being dinosaurs, they have nothing to do with the opening of this movie. The opening with actual dinosaurs. I was expecting a giant car. If you're disappointed because I didn't focus on the Dinobots enough, well, neither did the movie. Time to go save China. The 2010s will be looked back on with an interesting perspective. That time Chinese companies really influence Hollywood. And I say that like it's a past thing, because ever since the incident of 2020, relations have kind of dropped off the face of the earth. It was a lucrative market for any company willing to sell its soul. A billion people for any American company lucky enough to get a fan base. Dark of the Moon was a major hit in China, so this brought on some new investors when talks of another sequel came around. China Movie Channel and Giaflix Enterprises helped produce the new movie. Funding always comes with some strings attached. Chinese forums at the time found it pretty hilarious how many Chinese products just happened to be in rural Texas. Transformers 4 is almost like two movies. One half is about the Autobots hiding from the government, and the second half is about a giant CGI battle in the middle of Hong Kong. Oh no, Hong Kong's under attack! Better get the defense minister to send in the Chinese Air Force. Better have a random action scene with Chinese actress Li Bingbing. It is not a coincidence that the final battle is in Hong Kong, and not a mainland Chinese city. They never could have shown destruction of a mainland Chinese city. Transformers 2 had to censor itself when it showed some destruction of Shanghai. The Chinese didn't like showing weakness like that. But Hong Kong? Why not? They need to be protected. <laughs> What I'm saying here is I don't like propaganda. I don't want to see the Chinese military. I want to see the American military, and aircraft carriers, and choppers. America, fuck yeah! Freedom is the only way, yeah! So yeah, Chinese propaganda is bad, but what else is there to really say about this? There's really no point even talking about this anymore. If I would have made this video a few years ago, I could have used it as a sign of the future, but now it's just an anomaly. One where we can go, oh yeah, Transformers 4 did suck up to China like that. At least Bay didn't film next to concentration camps. Transformers 4 is an irredeemable convoluted mess. I could have went harder on this movie, but like, everybody knows that this is a mindless slog that millions were thrown into to tell an absolutely nothing story. It may have performed the best, but it was an absolute Molotov into the Bay vs. reputation. Transformers The Last Night is a terrible movie, but it didn't underperform because it was a bad movie. It underperformed because Transformers 4 was a bad movie. When people are asked what the plot of this movie even is, nobody can say. We can't just have a plotline about being on the run from the government. Now Transformers have to be created by aliens that wiped out the dinosaurs. Finally, we have to introduce this stupid idea of Transformers Knights. An idea so atrocious, it would put the Bayverse out of its misery. Optimus is not just a Prime, he's also a Knight. Everyone's Knights. And we're about to have fucking King Arthur, oh my god. As much as I hate this movie, I can't be too harsh. It's actually quite personal for me. You see, Transformers Age of Extinction was the first date I ever went on with my wife. This movie will forever be personally attached to my life. I fell asleep halfway through it. I'm an inventor. 